Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. And I don't know if you've been seeing what's happening in Castle Downs this past week, in the past couple weeks, maybe you've seen this. It's a, it's a very fascinating story. And again, maybe you've seen this, maybe you haven't, but an evacuation order was issued this week at uh, Castle Downs or last week. Uh, Castle Downs Point, after engineers investigating uh, a fire that happened in March, determined that the entire four-story structure lacked structural integrity. An entire uh, condo building was evacuated because they had a fire and when they started to investigate the fire, they thought, yeah, this was built very poorly, right? Like, and maybe you've been watching it and they were asked to evacuate because there was fear of collapse and they were looking at the building and, and they realized that the, the framing was done poorly and there was cracks everywhere and they were like, this is not safe. So they had to tell everyone to leave the building. And this building, I don't know the full story of this building, but... I can imagine that it was probably built very quickly and probably built as cheap as possible, right? And they started to maybe start to cut corners because they tried to save money. They wanted to make sure they made money on the project or whatever. And so they started trying to save money by not doing the job as well as they probably should have in this place. And as a result, this place is now no longer livable or usable until they can hopefully fix it or maybe they're going to have to start again. This, this building, and, and I, th- I was thinking about it And I was thinking about how many times in our lives, how often do we as people start to cut corners pretty much every single day. And we do this, uh, we sometimes do this at work and we don't like to admit we do it at work, but sometimes we like to kind of cut corners to make things go faster so we can try and get home earlier. Or maybe we, we, we want to impress our boss or we're trying to get the project done early and he's like, wow, you did a great job. You're like, yeah, but the quality is pretty poor. And I think not only do we sometimes do this at work, but sometimes we do it at home. We try and cut corners around bedtime so that way we can get our kids to bed as quickly as possible so that way we can go sit on the couch for the three hours that we get to live our life after our kids go to bed. I think sometimes we don't just do this at home or at work, but I think that oftentimes as people, we start to cut corners, especially as followers of Jesus, spiritually. I think what we like to do and sometimes is what we try and do is we try to make our relationship with Jesus, how we follow Jesus, as efficient as possible. We try and make sure that we can, you know, okay, I got you my five minutes now and this is my schedule and then tomorrow I'll give you five minutes. We try and make things short. We try and cram as much in as we can in a short amount of time. But I truly believe that as followers of Jesus, we're not supposed to rush into it. We're not supposed to rush it. We're supposed to experience it and be, and be patient and, and actually rest in his presence, not just try and check it off of our list. We try and cut corners when it comes to our relationship with Jesus. We pray probably less than we wish we did. We we realize our Bible has an inch of dust on the top of it. The Bible app is already undownloaded off of our phone because we haven't used it. Right, we have these moments and we're trying to, we try and fit it all in and our schedules are so busy that we try and cut corners to make things happen. And I think when Jesus was talking in Matthew chapter seven, these kind of thoughts maybe were in his mind and this is kind of the way the culture was as well. And this is what he says in Matthew chapter seven, verse 24. He says this, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds his house on solid rock Though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching, who hears my words and doesn't obey it is foolish. Like a person who builds a house on the sand. When the rain and floods come and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. It's interesting that it says mighty crash, right? It's not just like it might crash. It's like it's, it's a mighty crash. It's going to be loud. It's going to be abrupt. It's going to be painful. It's going to be the things that we wish it wasn't. And so we're going to start a new series today as we kind of start in September, as we lead into our 30th anniversary. It's a series that we're calling Built to Last. How do we build our foundation? How do we build on the rock rather than the sand? 
And those of us, maybe we've already built our house in the sand. It might be time to rip it up and get, on, get it on a truck and move it to the rock. How do we build our life that's actually going to make an impact, that it's actually going to last? So that way when the storms come, and the thing about this is that the storms will come, that when they come, we can actually make it through and we can actually find exactly what we need in Jesus when we build a firm foundation. And that's my prayer as we go through this series today. And we're going to start just with this verse and kind of go through it. I want to kind of go through some of the things that I see and the thoughts that I see Jesus kind of trying to present to us in the context of this verse. And the first thought I have is we got to hear and follow. If you go back to verse 24, it says this, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. So we have to hear it, but actually follow through with it. Not just be people who hear the word, who come and we read our Bible and we pray and we we go to church and we hear the word, but we don't let it actually pierce our hearts and change who we are. It's actually changed us to the core what Jesus was teaching us throughout Scripture and what God's done in our life. That is not just something that we do and we hear it and we're like, wow, that was amazing. And we go home and nothing changes. The word should change us. What, what Jesus is saying is like, like, don't just hear what I'm saying. Actually follow it. It's so much easier sometimes to be in a crowd and hear something than to actually step out and actually start to lead and start to follow and start to bring people with us. Not just to hear it, but to live it out. It's not enough just to hear the word. And hearing the word is amazing. And I want to encourage you, pray the word and speak the word and hear the word. Hearing is so important, but we have to know the difference between hearing and doing. Now, yesterday, my family and I, we went to the pool. And we thought it'd be easy to go to a pool because it's, there's a lot of them. We started doing research. They were all closed. They were all closed for maintenance and all this stuff. We're like, but we just want to go to the pool, right? Like, and to be honest, like, it's not like, very rarely am I like, Beth, we should go to the pool as a family. Like, it doesn't happen often. The one time I do it, they're all closed. So we do some research. We find out there's one in St. Albert that's, or in uh, Sherwood Park that's open. We're like, God, let's go. So we go to the, to, the, to the pool, and there's this big blue slide in this pool. And as soon as Jane walks out the change room, she's like, I'm going right to that blue slide. And I'm like, probably, like, walk, though. Like, I don't want you to run as fast as you can and slip, and then we're now we're in the hospital. Like, I don't want that. Let's be careful. So we go. We go down the slide once together, and then we go down the slide again together, and it's fun. We're having a great time. Jane's like, I want to go by myself. And I'm like, I I don't know if that's a good idea, right? That's a good parent. Then she convinced me to go by herself. Maybe I convinced me. I don't know. And so my brother-in-law was there, and and I was like, hey, I'm going to go down the slide, and then you send her down when, when it's safe, and then I'll catch her at the bottom. And I was expecting, so I go down and and I'm waiting for her. And I was expecting this face of pure joy coming down the slide. But what I was face to face with is my daughter upside down going down the slide head first. Now, I I was shocked. I'll be completely honest with you. Like, because I thought maybe she'd be on her back or whatever. She's on her back, but backwards. And I'm like, I'm the worst parent of all time. Because first of all, she can't see anything that's happening, right? Because she's literally like looking at the ceiling as she's going down the slide, does not know when it's about to open into the water. And I'm like, whoops. Anyway, so she comes out, I grab her. She starts crying because of course she's scared. And this is my favorite part of this story. I, I thought this was so funny. The lifeguard comes to me and goes, hey, do you think next time you could get her, get her to go feet first? I'm like, I was like, I'll try. That's what I said. I was like, I'll try. I'm like, do you think she wanted to do this, bro? Like, she's three years old. I was like, anyway, that's, I was just shocked. But it's the difference of, we can actually hear it, but it's it's different to actually follow through with it. See, I thought that she was just going to come down normal like like this, but she's not even barely strong enough to, like, sit up with the powerful water. We have to learn to hear it and to know what to do, but actually follow through with it in our life. To hear the word and the wise spirit. The wisest among us will hear it and live it out. I think we as as culture, we're fascinated by wisdom and knowledge and intellect. We're fascinated by it. We love research. But I think if we truly want to become wise, 
It's actually taking the Bible and living it out. Not just something that we read because we have to, but something we read that actually changes us from the inside out. Where we start to live it out day by day, moment by moment. Live it out at work and live it out at home and live it out on the road. Actually let it shift us and change us into the most beautiful things. But I think in life, just like what happened with Jane, living out what you think is possible might be really challenging. She, she, she thought it was going to be amazing, and she thought it was going to be beautiful. She's like, I'm not going by myself ever again. You're coming with me. And so we went down to three more times together. Living it out is the hardest part. We know the truth. We know that, say, pornography hurts us, yet it's still something that's a part of our life. We know that some of the things that we're watching on television are really affecting us and affecting our family, yet we're like, ah, it's, it's fine. It's just a show. We know we're supposed to honor our father and mother, yet when it gets down to it, it's really hard. I think some of us, we have moments that we know the truth, we know what we're supposed to do, but when we come face to face with the storm, when we come face to face with the chaos, it's hard to live it out. See, in Psalm 34, 8, common scripture, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. We have to taste and see. We have to experience him. It's, it's so much different to just know. We gotta experience him in a deep and real way as well. That his ways are better, his ways are higher. His joy is better, his peace is everlasting. He's the one who has all the most beautiful promises we could ever ask, think, or imagine. He has them for us. And a lot of us, we, we stop just short of actually experiencing them. Not just to know where he's going, but to follow him where he's going. I think sometimes God calls us to do something or calls us out of something into something new and we're so petrified of what that might look like in our life. How am I gonna make this work? And God's like, go. We're like, I don't know if I can do it. We know what he's saying, yet we don't like what he's saying. We know what he's speaking and we're like, ah, that's tough. We gotta learn how to hear the word and live it out. And then the second thing that kind of comes out of this is the storm. What's interesting about these verses is that it seems like both the houses were built in the same location or in a similar geographical location. That the storm that came hit both of the houses equally. Now the storm that comes to this, these houses, it comes at the same velocity and the same pressure and the same amount of water. It only one of them makes it through. I want to... I wanna, tell you that there are going to be storms that come. I actually heard this said once that everyone is always entering a storm in the middle of the storm or coming out of a storm. It's like how encouraging, you know, and it's like, it's like I made it out. It's like good luck, you know. The next one's on the way. That actually happened yesterday in NCAA football in Notre Dame. They had a game that started and then a wind and rainstorm came so they postponed the game and then as soon as they were about to start it back up, another storm was just about to come. So they had to postpone this game like two hours in order to actually play the game. This is actually kind of what it's like in our life is that storms, they keep on coming sometimes. And sometimes we think our foundation will last because we, we, we dug maybe a foot deep. We're like, that's going to last. Maybe it makes it through one storm, but the next storm might come. It's a constant process of building our life on the right things. See, the story here is not that the storm won't come if you build the house. The story is that if you build your foundation properly, the storm can't stand a chance against what God has built with you. The storm is going to come. But it's the effect of the storm that Jesus is talking about. What effect did the storms and chaos and pain, what do they have on us as followers of Jesus? Is our foundation built enough to actually withstand the storm? Our foundation has to be deeply grounded in the rock. And in Matthew 8, 23, it says, Then Jesus got into the boat and started across the lake with his disciples. Normal day. Suddenly, like, it's like, boom, suddenly, a fierce storm struck the lake. 
with waves breaking into the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him up shouting, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. Jesus responded, why are you afraid? You have so little faith. Then he got up and rebuked the wind and the waves and suddenly there was a great calm. As suddenly as the storm came, it left. The disciples were amazed. They said, who is this man? Even the winds and waves obey him. You ever been with someone sleeping in a moment where they really shouldn't have been sleeping? I just thought of some, some, way, some reasons or some places you probably shouldn't be sleeping. Number one, while you're about to pay for your groceries at the grocery store. Probably not a good place to fall asleep. Number two, while you're driving. Kind of dangerous. Number three, when I can't sleep, you shouldn't be able to sleep either. It's true. Frustrating thing when you're married and you look over, your spouse is fast asleep and it's two in the morning, you're like, I'm gonna go wake up a kid, you know what I mean? Like, she's like, why are the kids awake so much? Like, it's my fault, you know? No, I'm not, I've never done that, okay? Like, I promise, I've never done that. That would be like evil, okay? Like, never done that. This is a true story that happened with Beth and I. Uh, while, while I was waiting for, for Beth, we went on our honeymoon to Dominican Republic. We had to, she had to go to the doctor, and so I'm sitting there, day one of our honeymoon, maybe day two, I think it was day two, I'm sleeping on the waiting chair. Because I hadn't slept in like four days. And that's not a great place to sleep as your wife is sick and you're like, oh, give me a minute, you know. But another place you probably don't want to sleep is on a storm, in the, on a boat in the middle of a storm. It's not a, first of all, it's not an ideal like sleeping situation. And it's also like there's probably some better things you could be doing. But Jesus in the middle of chaos, in the middle of the storm, what's he doing? He's resting, he's sleeping. The storm is going on. The boat is sway, getting swayed by the waves. The disciples are scared, and Jesus is all tucked in cozy, sleeping in the boat. And the disciples, they see Jesus like, yeah, right, man. Get up. Come save us. And it's so funny. They say, come save us. Yet it says when he calmed the storm, they were amazed that he did that. It's like, what did they expect Jesus to do? So they had some faith that something would happen, but as soon as Jesus did it, they're like, what? How did he do that? What did they expect Jesus would do in this moment? What's fascinating about this is that many of the, of the disciples, if we know, were fishermen. A storm in the middle of a lake on a boat was not the first time they probably experienced something like this. They were petrified. Now you've heard this before, if you're flying, the only way to know if, if things are actually not good is you just pay attention to the flight attendants. They're nervous. Good luck. If the flight attendants are fine, you're like, ah, no problem. Right? Why? Because they've done it before. These disciples were scared. Even though they had seen it before, they'd, they'd experienced the waves, they'd experienced the storm before, yet this one, for some reason, felt different. I think sometimes we, we're so used to the storms that come and then all of a sudden a new one comes. We're like, ah, I don't know what to do. Some of us, we've been, been in financial pain for a long time. And we feel like we're kind of comfortable in it now. And then all of a sudden something else comes that we're not expecting. And it, sh it rocks us to the core. The storms may come and they will come. But I think Jesus, why he was able to sleep, why he was able to rest in the middle of it is because he had built his foundation in the right place. A, a foundation that was built to last. A foundation that no matter the turbulence, no matter, no matter the storm, no matter the waves, no matter the wind, no matter the chaos, he could rest knowing that he was still in his father's hands. He could rest. The disciples are all in a panic. They're like, yo, come panic with us. Right? Come be scared with me. Come be anxious with us. He's like, why don't we just tell the storm to stop? See, that's the power of who we worship. The power of the rock we build our foundation on is the one who can actually make a difference who can actually save us, who can actually restore us, who can actually 
bring us back to deep relationship and restoration. The storm's going to come, but we have to learn to build our foundation in the right place. And then the last thought I have today is the work. See, building a life that's built to last or building whatever it is that's built to last, that's built to withstand, is a lot of hard work. It's not easy to keep on digging and digging and digging. Has anyone ever dug a hole? It's hard. Like you get past the first little bit, you're like, easy. And it's like, I might break my shovel. It's hard to keep digging and digging and going and going. We're tired. It's like digging and digging. To start to build our foundation deeper. To start spending more time with Jesus and relationship and growing closer to him and spending time in the scriptures and spending time in prayer. So many people are quoted as saying, I'm too busy to not pray. I'm too busy to not spend time in his presence. And I think a lot of us, it's the opposite. We're too busy to pray. So our foundation is so minimal, it's so small. And I think these verses I'm about to read are some of the most profound, at least for me, as followers of Jesus, is this. Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? You know, some of the most profound verses that are challenging even for us, at least for me sometimes to read of like, it might not be a, Walk in the park. He says, take up my cross. Take up your cross and follow me. Building our life in the foundation of the rock isn't always going to be easy. It requires many things. It takes saying no to the things you might desire in order to say yes to the things God has for you. It might be saying no to your favorite show or whatever to say yes to reading the scriptures. It might mean saying no to the new car. It might mean saying yes to the generosity that God is calling you to. It might mean saying no to overtime and saying yes to serving. I hear so many people asking how they can hear God's voice. How, how do I hear him speak? If they haven't opened their Bible in a month. They haven't spent time in the scriptures for Months, and they're like, I don't hear God anymore. I'm like, he already spoke. Open the Bible and read it. Open your Bible and learn and spend time with him. That's how we build our foundation. It might not be easy. It might mean waking up early. It might be say, tough to say no to sleep and say yes to prayer. You know, in fact, we're starting a, Morning prayer gathering on Wednesdays at 6 a.m. This Wednesday, we're starting. I'm not a morning person in the least. At all, like at all. Like I, I want to, I just want to sleep, you know. But there's something so powerful when we sacrifice our flesh to grow our spirit. Something so powerful when we give up something, we sacrifice something in order to say yes to the right things. 6 a.m., I want to encourage everyone to come. I want to encourage you to come be a part of it. There's power when we come together corporately and pray. When we come together corporately and pray for our church, when we pray for our future, when we come together and pray for our families, and we pray for our kids, and we pray for our jobs, and we pray for our bosses, when there's something that shifts when we come together and we pray together. Something powerful happens. So that's going to be happening 6 a.m. every Wednesday here at the church. And we're going to have some worship. We're going to have prayer. It might be different every week, but I want to encourage you to come be a part of it. They might say 6 a.m. is early, and I'll say, yep, it is. But this is a way for us to dig. 
A way for us to rise up above the noise, to build on the right foundation, to take time away from the busyness and take time away from it all to pray together corporately. I want to encourage you to come be a part of it Wednesdays at 6, just right here at the church. But I think it's a sacrifice that will help us all get closer to Jesus. A sacrifice that helps us dig deeper and draw closer and build stronger. That faith is built through corporate prayer. I truly believe it. When we start to see miracles happening. So let's pray together and build our faith together. So that's going to be uh, Wednesday mornings at 6 a.m. starting this week. And we also have something that's going to be starting. And uh, Mike Stoffer and his wife Kayla, they're right there. They're going to be starting uh, kind of a, a midweek gathering. Um, it's like a, we're gonna, they're going to be studying through the book of John, but there's going to be some worship and some talking. It's going to be Thursday nights uh, at their house. And so I want to encourage you. This is a great place, again, to meet together midweek. The church isn't just supposed to be about Sunday morning. It's supposed to be a, what we do with our life is, is grow closer together, be generous with one another, and share the gospel. So I want to encourage you, Thursday nights, go chat with them. They'll tell you more information, but it's going to be amazing. I've got another way for us to worship together corporately, to grow together. You know, I believe that, that our jobs as pastors and my job as pastor is to help us grow closer to him and help us learn to build the deeper foundations so that it can't be destroyed by the waves and the storm. In fact, to a point of that our foundation can be so strong that we can actually rest in the middle of the storm. Can you imagine your most chaotic moment, the hardest thing you've gone through? Usually the first thing that happens is we can't sleep. Our anxiety is so high and we can't, sometimes we even get to a point we can't even like breathe. We're so anxious, we're so stressed and rest is the last thing we can find. Imagine a place where you could be so firm in your foundation that even though the waves are coming, you're resting in his presence, in his, in his life, in his love. Because what we do now prepares us for the storms that are going to come. We're either going to dig deep or we're just going to build. See, the foundation, it doesn't move, but what's built on top of it is what moves and shifts. And I want to end with this question that Jesus asked his disciples in Matthew 16. Just before uh, what we read earlier, uh, when Jesus was talking to his disciples, just before that moment, it says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do, you, who do people say the Son of Man is? Great question. I think it's a similar question we're asking today. People are asking, who is the Son of Man? Who is, who is he? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asks a different question. But who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the powers of hell will not conquer it. I think we know that verse. But it comes from a revelation of who Jesus is. See, Peter has this moment where they're saying, I may be a prophet. Who, they, who do they say I am? The prophet, Elijah. Who do you say I am? Peter says, you're, you're the Messiah. You're the Savior. You're, you're who we've been waiting for. And again, Jesus is talking to Peter and even Jairus. His, meaning, his name means rock or stone. And I think he is both in this moment telling Peter that he's going to use him to build his church. But I think at the second time, he's also saying that revelation is how the church will be built. Is by we know who Jesus is. We know what he can do. We know that he can calm the storm. We know that he can raise the dead. 
We know that he's going to die and then three days later he's going to come back. And that the church is going to explode. Based on this man, Jesus. Jesus is the rock that we build everything on. We build our families and we build our churches and we build our communities and we build our homes and we build our businesses on the reality and the revelation of who Jesus is. The storms will come. But we can find refuge. We can find strength and we can find rest when we build our life on the deep foundation. We can do this on the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done for us and what he's done for you. Everything else is just stuff and fluff. It has to be about Jesus. And so we build something that's built to last, that can withstand the storms, that can withstand it all. No matter the storm, we gotta hold on. No matter what you're going through, hold on. He's got you. And I think the most beautiful part is that even if we build our house on the sand for years and years and we keep rebuilding, we're like, God, what's happening? He's so gracious to come right back. You know, as the world gets darker, I believe our light needs to shine brighter. A life where we hear the word and we follow it. We don't just understand it, but we live it out. A life where we know the storms are coming, but we dig deep. We live. We understand the storm, so we build with that storm in mind. We won't be shifted by the waves and our faith won't be, it won't get diminished no matter what. You know, our takeaway today is this, is that the deeper you dig, the stronger your foundation. The closer we get, the less the storms will affect us. The closer we get to him, the more our faith is built. We have to keep on digging. Keep on going. Keep getting closer to him. We have to hear his words and live it out. So God, we come to you today, and first of all, I think, for me, I just repent of any time that I've built my life and I've built my foundation on the wrong things. Whether I've built it on appearance, or whether I've built it on wealth, or whether I built it on influence, or whether I built it, built it on things. God, I just come and I repent of any time I've done that. And God, I pray that today, all of us will build our life deeply rooted in you. I will keep on going, we'll keep on digging, we'll keep on growing closer and closer and closer to you in everything we do. God, I pray right now for Known Victory Church. God, I thank you that Known Victory Church is built to last. 30 years of incredible sacrifice and miracles. I thank you that it's just the beginning of what's about to happen in our midst. And God, I pray that as we go forward at home, at school, at work, at church, God, I pray you keep us humble. Keep us focused on you. and Help us build our life on you as our firm foundation. We'll taste and see that you are good. And I pray that we're willing to share that same thing with those we meet. In Jesus' name, amen.